Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, can you guys hear me? All right, awesome. All right, well, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm happy to be here. This has been an, actually a very fun and exciting day, talking to students, talking in the classroom, talking to the faculty. Um, and so I want to share with you some of the work that my research lab has been doing for the, for the last uh, for eight years or so while I've been at the fac been a faculty at the University of Washington. Um, and I, I'm going to start with an overview of our research, what we do broadly, and then focus more of the talk around two particular areas that I've been most passionate about, which is looking at the applications of computing to energy monitoring and sustainability and health monitoring. And the idea here is that you know, computing is already being integrated into our daily lives in many different ways, and it, it kind of cuts across everything we do in society, and, um, and, and two of which are projects that that we've been working on is in the sustainability area and health, which I'll talk about more in detail in a little bit. So uh, as an overview, we, we have a research lab that I, I, I uh, run that's fairly broad. So we have computer scientists, like electrical engineers, but we also collaborate with the med school. We have folks from mechanical engineering, civil engineering. We have folks from humanities, public policy that are also engaged in our lab. Really, the work that we do is very interdisciplinary. And for the kind of problems that we're trying to solve really requires you to think about solutions that, um, that, that have many different perspectives that you look at to to create these innovative different solutions. So we'll talk more about energy and health in a little bit, but I want to talk a little bit about the other stuff that we also do. We also do a lot of work in low power wireless sensing and developing new interaction technologies. And we only not only focus on the basic research and the applications of the work that we're doing, but we also do a lot of work in translating this technology out into the real world. So we do a lot of work in terms of commercializing it, either through open sourcing, spinning out companies, or even licensing the technology. So unlike most research labs, where we labs fit, typically focus on the basic science. We also focus a lot on the technology transfer of the work. Because one of the things that I'm personally passionate about is how do we take the things that we do in the lab and translate it to the real world so people can actually take advantage of it. So some of the other work we do before I dive into energy and health is we've been doing a lot of work in uh, improving interaction. So if you think about the modern computing platform, it's this thing that we have in our purse in our pocket. Um, and, and it's a pretty small, constrained device. So how do you type into this thing, right? You typically tap on a glass surface. There's no keyboard or a mouse. So we're really in, the, in, in an interesting paradigm shift where we're looking at alternate ways to interact with a computer that basically is barely the size of a, a little, a little uh, notepad. Um, and so we've worked in a, a variety of different areas. And, and I wanted to bring this paper up up too. So this was from my grad school days at Georgia Tech. Um, one of my colleagues, Ed Clarkson, uh, was also a co-author on this. And the reason I bring this paper up is because I never actually published this paper. So we tried to submit this paper to a bunch of different conferences, and it got soundly rejected. Um, and, it, and this paper was on 3D input for mobile phones. You can even tell from that picture. That's a pretty old phone. Most of you in the audience probably have never seen a phone like that. Um, but this is an old clamshell phone, and we basically created a way to do 3D input into this thing. So when you push harder on the key, it actually does something different. So if you push hard, you can get a cap, capital letter. If you push lightly, it's a lowercase letter. So simple things like that. So we created the technology and the set of interaction techniques to, that we designed around what it would mean if you had 3D input. Um, and so this paper got rejected, you know, a lot of different comments. It was things around, you know, you know, I don't think we'll ever see phones that have 3D input. What's the use case for this thing? This is not practical. And then 10 years later, we have the iPhone uh, 6S and the 7 that basically has 3D touch built into it. In fact, the work that we did that at that time that was never published, we basically uh, self-published it. We put it on our websites, and, um, and Apple actually used the work that we had done in that first report that we created to basically implement the 6S and the new 3D touch on the Apple phone. Um, and it just shows that sometimes, you, even though you're working hard on innovating something, and if, even if it's not perfectly timed, um, if you can persevere through it, uh, eventually this, the stuff that you do at the basic science and the engineering of something that's maybe be ahead of its time can have an impact down the road. It took 10 years before this got implemented on the phone and massively adopted, and, and it actually had impact. Whereas 10 years prior to that, even the research communities didn't really appreciate what we were doing. So this is, this is just some example of the kinds of things that we've done in the past. 3D input, gestural interaction, looking at how do you communicate with a computer without having to type on a mouse or a key, using a, a keyboard or a mouse. So this is another project we did more recently called Sideswipe. So the idea behind this is how do you interact with a phone without occluding the thing you're interacting with? So if you have a phone and you're scrolling on the surface and you're trying to read an article, and when you're scrolling, your finger actually occludes the thing you're reading. So you have this like contorted thing that you might do to kind of read and scroll at the same time. 
but we created a way that you can actually put your finger on the perimeter of the phone and scroll without ever touching the phone. And the way it works is it actually uses the wireless signals that are coming from the Wi-Fi and the GSM radio to basically identify the movement of your finger through that wireless signal. So you don't actually have to add anything to it. It's just using the signals that are bouncing off your finger to identify the movement of your hand. And so you could do this interesting thing where you can interact with your phone without even having to put your finger on top of the thing that you're trying to look at, so you're not going to occlude it. So that's an example of the kinds of things that my lab's been working on um, in, in the area of interaction. We've been also doing a lot of work in low power sensing. So looking at, you know, the, the, uh, looking at how you can build sensors that are so low power that you can either run them off of a battery for 20, 30, 40 years, not even worry about replacing the batteries, or even build them in such a way that they can be um, self-powered or perpetually powered. So the top is an example of a sensor that we built uh, about five years ago, which is a sensor that gives you temperature, humidity, uh, mold information on a little coin cell battery, kind of like a hearing aid battery, and it lasts 25 years. And so it's so low powered, you can actually just put it in the inside of a wall and let it monitor for many years, and you don't even have to worry about replacing it. And so on the right is an example, uh, is actually the product that actually came out of that. So we commercialized this technology, and it got acquired by Sears last year. And that's the product that we built. You can buy it on Amazon and a bunch of other places. So this is a little device that can monitor temperature, humidity, mold, and things that might be happening in the house before major damage happens. But you don't have to ever worry about replacing the batteries. The, the sensor on the bottom is an example of something that we built on top of the, the original platform, which is a little power harvester that harvests energy, so it actually doesn't have a battery at all. It's a little uh, bellows that has ethyl chloride in it, and as the temperatures in the room is fluctuating, it expands and contracts at a, in a, 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 by a few millimeters, and as it's op expanding and contracting, it's actually harvesting energy to power the sensor. So this thing is actually perpetually powered. It actually doesn't need a battery at all. It'll last forever. You put it in an attic or in a crawl space, you put it in a room, the minute temperature fluctuations is enough to power this thing. So it'll power it three or four times a day to basically do a sensor read, and it sends it to, a, to the cloud through Wi-Fi, and then that's it. So, so looking at technology where you don't even have to worry about replacing batteries and cutting the cord is something that we've been focusing on. So this just gives you a little bit of a whirlwind tour of the, the various projects we've been working on in, the, in these other spaces. But let me dive into some of the energy work. Um, so one of the things I've been really passionate about is looking at how can computing technology play a role in helping manage our energy and water usage in the home. And so looking at you know, how do we help consumers and empower consumers with actionable feedback on allowing them to make better decisions about where energy is going and what they could do to improve their energy efficiency in their home. The challenge here is that uh, even though we know a lot about how buildings like this operate, so there's technology for buildings like this that will exactly the one we're in right now in terms of how much energy we consume, but in the home, it's actually really hard to know. People live their lives in different ways. They have different technologies. They have different devices in their home. The, the, the community actually ha doesn't have a really good understanding of energy usage in a home. Um, and so one of the challenges is how do we even design technology for, for being more efficient in a home environment when we can't even, from the beginning, um, identify ways to help consumers. And if you think about energy and water usage, so people often t tell me, well, why do you focus on the home? Isn't it the big factory that's the thing you want to focus on? Well, actually, it turns out that a quarter of our energy usage are the things that we do in our daily lives. A quarter of our energy usage is actually in the residential space. In fact, this, is, this chart's a little old, so that pie is actually getting bigger. Um, water is even more fascinating. So more than half of our water usage is actually in the home. So this is not including, so this is only potable water usage. So this doesn't include you know, reclamated water, irrigation water for crops and, and for farms. This is potable water use in the US. More than half is consumed in our home. All right? But the other kind of interesting part is, you see, that, you see about 20% of it um, is actually what they call, a little bit over, over a quarter of it, is what they call um, uh, 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 public water that is unaccounted for. In other words, we have no idea where it went. And so if you think about it, what does that mean? How can you lose water, right? You know, a quarter of our water uses, we have no clue what happened. Was it stolen? Was it, um, was, did it leak out before it get, got to the end point? Was there some issue of monitoring the usage at the, at, the, at the reclamation point? So even if you think about it, if we could figure out what happened to that 20%, and let's say all of it is our leaks, and if we fix that leak, you know that would actually address the entire drought issue we have in the United States. Right? Um, so there's a, a significant amount of water that we don't even know where it goes. And there's no technology to help us address this at all at the moment. Um, think about our user experience, right? So either yourself or your parents or anybody that actually gets a water electric bill. So this is an unfortunate bill that one of my colleagues got um, a, a few years back. This is a $3,000 water bill. So he gets a $3,000 water bill. What does he do? The first thing that he does is comes to me. 
It's like, oh, you do water research, figure this out. Um, and it's a $3,000 water bill that basically, if you look at the graph on the bottom left, um, it doesn't tell you much. Here's how much they consumed for the last few months in this big spike. Okay, that's useless. That doesn't tell me anything about where the leak happened or was there a leak or not. If you do the math, this is 3,300 gallons per day, right? And so when this individual got this bill, um, they, they got this little dye pack in the mail at the same time that says, yeah, put this little dye pack in your toilet to see if your toilet's running too often. So any person that's taken intro to physics would know that if you have a three-quarter inch pipe and you ran that water nonstop, you can't consume 3,300 gallons with that water pressure. So even the utility has no clue where that water went. Um, you know, the sad part is at the bottom right-hand corner, it says you know, your account has been automatically debited $3,000 for your auto pay. Um, so it turned out that in the state of Washington, if you fix the problem within 60 days, they'll actually forgive it for one time. Like, so they'll forgive it. Um, but, even, I mean, this, but this just tells you that there's actually, even the utilities don't have a clue on where the water or energy is actually going. And think about how, as consumers, we try to figure this out. So you have these things called uh, electrical meters, right? And how do you even read this? Like, these things typically have esoteric numbers like kilowatt hours and CCF. And the average consumer doesn't know how to read a meter to know how much energy that they've actually used, and, and, and let alone know even where the meter even is. My mom actually puts a flower pot in front of it because it looks so ugly. And so we can, we can never even find the thing. Um, so if you think about how technology could be d designed to address this, where you can get people better information about exactly where their energy is going in their home, how would you solve it? All right? So one way you could solve this is by using a set of distributed sensors. So you could build a sensor and put it in different parts of the, in the house. Like you could put a sensor in the microwave. You could put one by the coffee maker, one by the bean grinder. So you can tell I'm from Seattle. Um, uh, the refrigerator. And then, then you need one for every light. And that's just like, that's only a quarter of this uh, kitchen. What about the refrigerator? What about the thing that you can't pull off the wall, like the oven? So distributed sensors don't quite work because it's such a hard installation process. It's such a cumbersome, invasive install process. So our research has looked at how do we build one sensor that plugs into an electrical outlet, and then a sensor that goes onto your plumbing system that can identify water and electricity usage down to each appliance. So can you reduce all that down to one really sophisticated sensor and try to do the same thing that could happen with a distributed sensor? That's what we've been working on for the, for the last uh, eight years or so. And so the way this works is kind of interesting. So, uh, so prior approaches, people have tried to do this, is they put a little energy meter on your house, and they look at how much power is, uh, is fluctuating. So if you use 1,000 watts, that might be an oven. If you use 100 watts, that might be a light bulb. But it turns out a lot of things in the house actually have the same energy profile. You know, a lot of consumer electronic devices are between 30 to 50 watts. So you can't really do that analysis. You need more signal to tease apart different appliances that look the same. And so the work that we've done is we actually figured out that consumer electronic devices, like the charger from my iPhone here, or the charger from my laptop, or the power supply for this projector that's beaming this image, um, all have these little power supplies called switch mode power supplies. All this does is it takes 120 volts and gets it down to a usable 12 volts, 15 volts. So it's just a little power transformer. But it turns out that because they're, be they're being designed to be efficient, more efficient, cheaper, smaller, they all have the side effect where they create electromagnetic interference. So how many of you have been in a situation where you're about to get a phone call, but before the phone rings, your speakers start to buzz or some weird sound starts to coming out of speakers? That's actually what's happening, is electromagnetic interference can couple to anything in the environment. And it turns out when you plug something into a power line and you're operating, on the power line, this electromagnetic noise is actually propagated throughout the entire electrical system. And for many years, engineers just ignored it, right? They just said, yeah, that's just noise, we can't do anything with it. It turns out that that can tell you a lot about the energy usage in your home, and that's the signal we've used. So this noise that people have ignored for many years, we actually use as our signal source. So you might ask, what kinds of things exhibit this kind of behavior? Turns out almost everything. Anything that we use, a light bulb, a television, a charger, you know, your gaming console, your computer, anything that has a switch mode power supply um, is pretty much inside of a, uh, that would work here, and that's pretty much any consumer electronic device. So here's an example. So this is, um, if I took a snapshot of the power line, if I plugged one of our devices in, the x-axis um, is the frequency. So if you look, think about a tone, so if you think about it in the audio domain, each, each one of the frequencies is at the x-axis, and the y-axis is time. So as time goes up, you'll see different tones coming and going. And that's kind of the analogy we're going to use, these tones. Radio signals is another way to think about it. But these are basically the electromagnetic interference from all the devices on the power line. So from, if I just plug this device in, I can see the light bulb turning on and off. I can see when the LED monitor turned off, when the charger was plugged and unplugged. 
And so that's the signal that we've been using. So we use AI and machine learning on that signal to say, well, what just turned on and off? And so if you take a closer look, the way it works is we took a bunch of appliances and modeled their electrical capabilities. So we took an appliance, we took the circuit from it, and said, well, what kind of noise would it generate? And then when we see the noise on the power line, we can reverse engineer the kind of components that would have caused that noise, and then we can figure out, oh, in fact, that's a light bulb. Because a light bulb and a TV are designed in very different ways, right? Their components are completely different, and so they're going to, they're going to exhibit different kinds of noise characteristics. So here's what a TV looks like on the right. So as you're watching a movie, the you know, scene gets brighter and darker and lighter. And as it's doing this, the frequency is shifting over time. A light bulb's not going to be do doing that. A light bulb stays pretty steady. Um, a dryer's not going to be really doing that either. It's going to get to a certain temperature, cool down, get to a certain temperature. But a TV is going to have a lot more shifting because of the cap capabilities and what it actually reflects is the characteristics of that device. And so we actually created signatures for all these kind of appliance uh, devices. So uh, the, the bottom right is an example of a hair dryer. We can detect when the cool mode has started, when you hit the fan part of it, because they all exhibit different noise characteristics, and we're able to model that from the power line. And so what we can do with this is we can start to identify appliance usage down to each device without having to have sensors everywhere. Again, this is only one sensor conveniently plugged in somewhere near maybe a Wi-Fi router. So, so for water, we do something similar. So water, we wanted to do the same thing where from a single point, can we figure out where water is being consumed so we didn't have to cut into the pipe behind every single appliance? Think about installing a device behind every toilet and washing machine. It's a pretty messy situation. And so we wanted to figure out how can we do it easy from one location. So um, the way the plumbing system works is that you get water coming in, and most people don't realize this, but the hot and cold water are actually, you know, they branch out, but they're actually tied together by the water heater. Right? Um, and so cold water comes in, it gets branched out, the water heater kind of heats the water up. And so what we figured out was you can actually put a little pressure sensor on one of your, uh, on, the, on a hose bib, for example. And it turns out that when you flush a toilet or use a valve, it creates what's called water hammer. So many of you have probably had a situation where a neighbor's taking a shower or a roommate's taking a shower, and you can kind of hear that somebody's using water from far away. You can kind of hear that sound propagating throughout the plumbing system. And when you turn on and off a valve, you have what's called water hammer. So when all that water is gushing through and you turn it off, it comes to a quick stop, and that creates a water hammer. And it turns out the kind of valve that closed and opened tells you from the water hammer what kind of valve was it. Was it a toilet valve? Was it an electromechanical valve from a washing machine or a dishwasher? Or was it a hand valve from a regular faucet? And it turns out that little signal can tell you about water usage. So here's an example of what a faucet signal looks like, a toilet signal, and a tub. So the shape of those signals look the same for a tub, but the characteristics are different, right? So, so a toilet's going to have a different kind of valve than a tub versus a faucet. And so from that little sensor, so the example the, on the right, or sorry, on the left is a little sensor that you screw onto a hose bib, and it connects to Wi-Fi to, uh, uh, to your router, and it basically monitors the plumbing for these water hammer signals, and it can tell you, oh, the dishwasher was run, the, to the, the toilet was flushed, and how much water it consumed. So A, you don't have to cut into a pipe, and B, it gives you information down to each individual plumbing fixture in your house. So think about how easy that is to scale. So we did a, a set of analyses on this. So it actually works quite well. For the electricity technology, it's about 93% accurate in terms of identifying that, yes, that was the toaster that ran, or that was the washing machine that ran. The same thing for water. Water is actually much more accurate because there's, very, there's fewer number of appliances to choose from. In a home, you have about 100 electronic devices, whereas in terms of water devices, you might have a dozen water-consuming units in the house. So what have we done with this? So here's some example user interfaces that we've built. So this is something that somebody could, they download this app, and you actually get the energy usage, you know, how much I consumed, how much I owe. But the cool thing is down here, this is the usage information down to each appliance. So my main floor lighting consumes 19% of my energy bill. Uh, my refrigerator is 10%. My laptop is 1%. And if the thing is lit, that means it's on at that given moment. So one of the things that my wife and I do is before we leave, we quickly look at our phone to see, okay, do we forget something that's on? Um, or if we leave and the phone knows that we're gone, it reminds us that, do you want to turn that thing off that just was left on? But this gives you actionable feedback on exactly what is how much energy is being consumed for your energy bills down to the real-time data. This is what water looks like. So on the x-axis on the bottom is basically the various uh, water appliances. Uh, we had this interesting situation one time where um, 
we have, I have it set up that when my wife and I and the kids are on vacation, if any water gets consumed that's not irrigation, we get an alert. Because there shouldn't be no water being used, right? Because that means there's a leak or somebody's like in the house. Um, and it turned out that we were getting water uh, events coming from the toilet. Call the grad students, like, yeah, the thing's screwing up, go fix it. And he, I gave a false positive on the toilet. And it turned out that the cat has, had figured out how to flush the toilet on the handle. The cat was sitting on the bowl, on the top of the bowl, and pulling on the handle and flushing the toilet. Um, and so, um, so, so in that case, the grad students were right. They, their thing did work, and it was not a problem. But anyway, it was the toilet being flushed by the cat. Um, but this gives you information down to each level. And so if you had a leak, you can identify this many, many, many months before. So in that $3,000 water bill, the issue was that billing happens every 60 days. Right? So a leak, if a leak happens on day one, it takes 60 days before you get a report back from your utility. In this case, you can identify a leak pretty much instantly that when it happens. So just think about the water savings in terms of leaks with this kind of technology. So one of the things that we found when we've deployed this is really surprising insights. So this is a photo shoot I did for the New York Times um, where they wanted to find a house that had our technology installed and they wanted to do this really dramatic shot of let's take all the appliances out of this house and put it in the backyard and we're lining them up from the bigger, biggest consuming devices to the lower consuming devices. So this is really similar to some of the books like What the World Eats that Peter Menzel did where he basically had this really interesting book he created where he put the contents of what people eat in the world onto their dining room table. It was really eye-opening to see what people in North Carolina eat versus people in Cambodia or Zimbabwe. It's just what they're, you know, what, what, and it's just, it's, that, that dramatic shot is what they were looking for. And so this is what they started to do. They started yanking appliances out. Um, and these were, you know, yeah, I mean, th these, these are the kind of things that consume water and electricity. And so he wanted to set this up in a way that, you know, the big consumers are in the front. And so this is what the shot ended up looking like. So this was the picture in the New York Times. Um, so if you had to guess, you know, what are the big consumers? I'll give you the first one. They had a pool. So they have 30% of their energy is the pool, right? So just get rid of the pool. You can save 30% of your energy. What do you think the second biggest consumers were? Like, what do you think consumes a lot of energy in your house? And so when we, when we asked these uh, uh, owners of these homes, the occupants, they said, oh, it's our kitchen, right? Our, our washing machine, sorry, our dishwasher, our, our, our oven, our, our um, uh, refrigerator. It turned out it wasn't. It was actually their lighting. So they didn't quite, they forgot about lighting, but lighting makes sense. They're in San Francisco, by the way, in the Bay Area, so they don't have air conditioning. They, don't, they use air conditioning very rarely. The DVR was number three, the digital video recorder, the thing that's out of sight, out of mind. The reason why the DVR was 13% is first, they had three of them, and secondly, when a DVR operates, you know, you set it up to record a show, and they don't want you to miss that show, and the, even though it looks like the thing is in sleep mode, the hard drive is still spinning at full speed. The whole computer's running at full speed. That thing consumes about 100 watts. There's three of them. That's 300 watts nonstop. And how would a consumer ever know that? It's out of sight, out of mind. The DVR, it looks like it's off, but it's not really. But the DVR was the number three big consumer. In fact, the TV was number four. The, all the kitchen appliances combined didn't even add up to 5%. The thing that they thought was the biggest consumer, second to the uh, pull pump, didn't even add up to 5%. Right, so you can always see, already see the disconnect in what people's mental model of energy usage is to what's actually happening, right? Or if you had an appliance failing, you wouldn't know. What if my refrigerator is failing and what if it has a big spike in energy use? These are the kinds of things that people are able to do and, 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 and to leverage this information. Here's an example of an energy report that's done by auditors. So when people use our technology and go into a home to do an energy audit, instead of just saying, oh, you need better uh, thermostats and this and that, here you can actually do an energy audit with a device. You go in, install the device, and you can get a full report of exactly how much energy each room consumes and how, much, uh, and, and how that impacts your energy usage. So you can do a really thorough energy audit that goes well beyond what they can do now. So this is some of the example reports that we're able to generate. So you can see that you have the living room and it's broken down. You have the bedroom, the kids' bedroom. Um, you can also address this, you know, this debate that's been going on for many years with a spouse. It's like, who takes the longer shower, right? We can figure that out with this. And who consumes more water? Um, so, um, and, and, and so you have that data. So the other thing we've been doing is we've been working with utilities where they've changed the utility bill. So here's an example of an example bill from ComEdison where instead of getting a regular bill, you actually get a bill that shows your top 10 consumers in your house and how you compared to the last month. So did you actually in increase your energy efficiency? And it also compares you to your neighbors that have similar kind of appliances. So there are, there used to be, there are companies that actually send you comparative bills to your neighbors, but they don't know who to compare you to. So I have an electric car, and I always get compared to the wrong neighbor, because if you have an electric car, your energy use is going to be higher because of the charging. 
And so what we can do, because we're able to categorize the different types of households, we compare you to the right kind of household. And so it's both normative billing, so comparing you to your neighbors, but also comparative to yourself in terms of, are, is it a, is it a you know, change in environmental, uh, environmental change? Is it hotter or colder now? Or is it because, you know, is the appliance failing or is your appliance older? And the bottom actually gives you feedback on what you could do to improve your efficiency. You know, it looks like your uh, refrigerator is actually le less efficient than most of the other refrigerators that look like that. And so if you were to upgrade to an ENERGY STAR refrigerator, it would take five years to pay back the cost of this refrigerator, and here's how much energy you would save. So really tailoring the feedback on the bill to what you could do that's actionable. And so this is yet another way to engage with consumers with the technology that we've built. So, um, so this technology, we actually spun it out of a company, and, and we sold it to Belkin in 2010. So this was a company that we spun out, and it was actually work I did as a grad student and as a faculty member, and it was acquired by Belkin in 2010. And so Belkin now owns and, and sells this technology now. Um, and some of the impact has been really uh, interesting. So a lot of this stuff is integrated into smart meters. Uh, the Department of Defense uses it for military bases. Um, it turns out military bases don't use meters out at all. They typically pay a bulk fee for their energy usage. And so this is actually really useful for them because now they know exactly where the energy is being used because they don't have to pay the bulk fees anymore. Um, the bottom left is a really interesting uh, conversation I had with um, uh, Secretary Chu. So this is former Energy Secretary, Secretary Chu. So that's me there in, the, at, at, um, in DC uh, reviewing a bunch of energy data. And so this is a Nobel laureate. So Secretary Chu, Nobel laureate, uh, who actually didn't realize that the number one consumer in his particular house was the DVR. So this is us reviewing his data and showing, look, hey, you know, look at this. And so that was actually the conversation that led to us actually going through the Energy Star process to mandate that DVRs actually comply with Energy Star. It turned out that Energy Star didn't mandate DVRs to actually go in a low power state. There was, there was a loophole in there. And so this was the initial conversation I had that actually mandated DVRs to go in a low power state, which they had been able to get around with for many years for obvious reasons because it's cheaper not to do that. Uh, the bottom right is an example of utilities, uh, workers going in and installing our technologies. I mean, the, the day when they installed the first device in a home that wasn't ours was just huge. So the impact that this is having is just great. It's also leading to a lot more industries. A lot more companies are now popping up that's doing similar work that we are that's based on our, on our research. So, um, so this, is, this is what we've been doing in, in the energy space. So that's our energy work. Now I'm going to shift gears to the other side of the lab. Uh, which is in looking at technology for personal health monitoring. So, so similar to energy, I have a personal interest and passion for building technology that has, a, that has an impact on society, and health is another one. And my hypothesis is that one of the, the innovative technologies that's going to have a big role in the health industry is going to be the mobile phone. So the mobile phone has this opportunity to potentially increase the quality of care that we can deliver um, and, but while decreasing cost. All right. And so if you think about the health industry, you know, what are the big innovations and paradigm shifts in health? Um, so point of care diagnostics is, is one of them. So I, I'm ignoring things like vaccinations and, and big breakthroughs in medication. I'm thinking about diagnostics for now, so, so just bear with me. So point of care diagnostics revolutionized um, uh, uh, disease treatment. So the fact that you can have an ultrasound machine in a general practitioner's office was game changing. If you had a, if you had a belly ache or belly pain, they could quickly do an ultrasound and figure out what's going on. Um, you could do a point of care blood test. You know, at that moment, you could figure out what's happening. So the prognosis to treatment was actually much higher quality. The, the treatments were higher quality because the prognosis was better because you were getting to treatment sooner. Um, the, the next big paradigm shift is going to be the mobile device, but we don't know quite what it's going to be. Uh, so this is an example of a little pulse oximeter that clips to your finger and it connects to your phone. And, and kind of integrated with this new paradigm shift are wearable devices. So most of you have probably seen or used any of one, one or many of these uh, devices. It could be a Fitbit or a Jawbone. It could be one of these Withing scales. So this is happening. This is where we are with the wearables community right now in terms of fitness monitoring, health monitoring. And there's huge opportunities for this. This is enabling people to manage and or at least monitor their health at home, which allows us the opportunity to do long-term tracking of health to identify disease well before uh, big issues happen. Right? One of the biggest challenges in the health industry right now is typically people are symptomatic. They go to a physician's office, and often it's too late to either do something or maybe it's a little bit later than it could be to have a positive outcome. But if you can identify issues well before you're symptomatic, so while you're asymptomatic, you have the possibility of addressing a lot of these things. So wearable technology has that potential, but we don't quite know where that's heading. 
Um, but the mobile phone, however, is already pretty popular. If you think about the mobile phone, um, that's something that people already have a huge affinity for, right? Um, these devices, you may forget to charge. You may forget it on your nightstand, or you might get bored of it. But if you forget your phone, you're probably going to go back home to go get it for a variety of other reasons. It's your communication tool. It's your email. There's a lot of reasons why it's with you. But if you can embed health sensing techniques and capabilities into the mobile phone, we have the capabilities of pushing healthcare diagnostics into the home, which allows us to scale in many new ways. So this is a conference we, um, uh, we attended and presented at. This is TED Med. So TED, most of you may know, does all these uh, visionary talks. But TED Med was a visionary conference around medicine. And the idea was, could you build a mobile phone that had everything you needed to do on it, where you could do a full physical exam using a phone? So, so this is an example room. So that, it's hard to see that picture, but that's our former Surgeon General, uh, Regina Benjamin, that's actually getting a full physical using a phone. And so this one doesn't quite only use the sensors on the phone. It actually uses attachments and stuff. But basically, the core of it is a phone with a bunch of different attachments. You could do heart rate, EKG. You could do pulse oximetry, lung function, a bu bunch of other stuff. And it, it, that's a reality. This was a few years ago. You can do a full physical using a mobile phone. Right? That's already happening. The challenge is that, well, if you have these gadgets you need to plug into the phone, you have that same issue with the wearables movement, which is what, if it, what happens if you forget about it? What happens if it's not with you when you're having an asthma attack or when something's occurring? So one of the things we've been looking at is, OK, let's take a step back. What's on a phone? Well, a phone has a lot of sensors on it. It's got a microphone. In fact, it's got two microphones, three microphones. The, modern, the, the, the latest iPhone 7 has two cameras on the back and one on the front. It's got three total of three cameras. It's got accelerometer, gyro. It's got, uh, um, um, it's got the capacitive touch screen. It's got a flash on it. It's got multiple speakers. How can we take advantage of these sensors that we often take for granted, right? We typically use this for telephony, some basic stuff, you know, Pokemon Go, Angry Birds, that kind of stuff. But could we take advantage of it in new ways where we can use those for diagnostic purposes? Um, and that's what we've been focusing on. So what we've done is we've actually come up with clever ways to leverage these existing sensors on a phone to do diagnostics for a variety of different diseases. All right. Um, and so some of the things that we've been doing is um, these are just some examples. I'm going to go into details with a subset of these. So we've been doing a, a bunch of different projects around non-invasive blood screening. So how can you use the flash and the camera on a phone to basically identify the constituents in the blood? So one example I'm going to talk about is hemoglobin. By putting your finger over the camera and flash and by modeling the amount of certain wavelengths being absorbed by the perfusion of the blood in the fingertip, we can actually tell you how much hemoglobin is in your blood without ever doing a, finger, uh, doing a draw out of your blood, right? non-invasively. Uh, same thing for bilirubin. So hyperbilirubinemia is an issue for uh, newborns. So how do we figure out how much bilirubin is in the blood without ever doing a blood draw? Just imagine what you could do with that when you could do non-invasive blood screening. And so that's an area we've been working on. We've been working in the area of pulmonary assessment. So people with chronic asthma, cystic fibrosis, COPD, where you need to monitor your lung function, where you typically use a pretty expensive clinical device, we figured out how to use the microphone to be able to identify your lung function without having to have an extra gadget with you. Um, cardiovascular disease is another one. We have an app that can actually do blood pressure monitoring. So from the mobile phone, you can actually track your blood pressure over time. And so you don't have to worry about the brachial cuff. You don't have to worry about this other device. Um, you still need to check your blood pressure professionally you know, every few months. But at least in the meantime, you can see how it's tracking just by using the phone, which you might have near, near you, uh, uh, you're more likely to have near you. Doing a number of projects around sleep. So sleep hygiene has been a big issue. Um, sleep is actually diagnosed, you know, things like sleep apnea are typically diagnosed in the clinic. You have this sensor technology all around you. You're in a lab. How, I mean, how do you even sleep in a lab, let alone with all the sensors all around you? So we've created ways that you can actually monitor your respiratory rate on the phone that's sitting next to you on your bedside table. All right? and, um, and so we have a number of projects where we can non-invasively get your respiratory rate and detect when there's a sleep apnea event, when you have you know, elevated respiratory rates, and those kind of things that are impacting your sleep. Um, and so these are just some examples of the things we're working on. And I'm going to dive into a little bit of this to share with you some of the stuff that we've done in this space and the clinical impact it's having. So measuring lung function is one of the first projects we started out with. Um, so some of you may or may not know what spirometry is, but on the bottom left is an example of what a person would do uh, to basically measure their lung function. If they have asthma or COPD, um, it, this is kind of the mainstay for a respiratory monitoring. So if you have a cardiovascular disease, you might do an echo, you might do an ECG or EKG. 
for, 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 for the pulmonary space, it's spirometry. The middle is an example of a more expensive clinical spirometer. So the, both of the devices on the left are about $10,000 devices. And they make home spirometers also. You can actually buy this from like Walgreens or any pharmaceutical ph pharmacy. Um, but they don't actually give you the same level of information as the clinical device. So most, most pulmonologists don't even look at that data because it doesn't give you useful information. Um, and so the challenge is that how do you create this experience in the home? So if you, for example, ha or if you have, you know, if you're treated for a certain disease and you need to basically figure out what your lung function is to, be, to either change your, the treatment or know if you need to go to urgent care or an ER if you're having an asthma attack or a pulmonary exacerbation, there's no way to really know until you go back to the physician. A lot of people live very far from their pulmonologist. So if you had a way to monitor your lung function, you can actually detect things earlier. So if you did it daily, you can detect that, you know what, something looks like it's uh, not tracking right. Let's go check that out before something major happens. Or if you are having an issue, you can try to get that, those numbers sooner. So what we actually developed was an app called SpiroSmart. So SpiroSmart is a mobile phone spirometer that uses a, um, the microphone on the mobile device to basically assess your lung function. So the way that um, spirometry works is on the left, you see that somebody puts their mouth on a tube and they blow as hard as possible. And that gives you the amount of volume of air coming out. And so we, what we essentially did was we basically turned the microphone into a volume measurement device. And so the way it works is you hold this phone in front of you, arms reach away, and then it's got a little user interface to guide you to the maneuver, and you literally just blow at the face of the phone. So you keep your mouth open, and then you actually do a forced expiratory maneuver, kind of what you would do in a tube, but you just do it uh, against the face of the phone. And the microphone is picking up all the acoustics that are generated from the body, and it's actually creating uh, a flow volume curve that's similar to what you would see in a clinical spirometer device. So in this case, it's emulating a little ball. So, as you, so it wants to encourage you to blow harder and harder. And as it detects that there's less and less air left, the ball comes down. And what, it comes back with a flow volume curve and your vitals for basically your lung function. So how does this work? So typical spirometers use a turbine. All it is is a little sensor that spins faster as you blow more air through it. So it's pretty simple. Problem for us is we don't have a turbine. Like We actually have nothing. We don't even have a mouthpiece. So what we do is we use this trick that we borrow from speech recognition. Um, so when you blow out, uh, a lot of things get activated. One of the things that get activated is your vocal tract. So the vocal tract is, is part of uh, uh, the, the trachea here, and you have the vocal tract. So what happens is as air is coming out of the trachea, if you have any kind of obstruction or restriction, the, the frequency of the, uh, the sound coming out is going to change. And so what we do is we listen to the sound coming out, and the change in the frequency tells you how much air is flowing through. So it, the, the, the analogy is that you can have a tube and you blow air through it, and if you add an obstruction inside of it, or if you put your finger in into a hole, the, the tone that it plays out, the tune that comes out the other end is different, It's kind of like a woodwind instrument. So we basically turn the human body into our flow sensor. So all we're listening for is the changes in frequency, and the body is telling us what the flow is coming out of it. So it's very different. Instead of having a sensor, the body can tell us that because we can listen to how much obstruction there is. And so the way we figured this out was, um, so we created a 3D model of the entire vocal tract. Um, so this is actually a 3D printout of somebody's trachea. So we MRI'd a bunch of patients, and we created a 3D model of what the airflow would be like to the body. And so we printed it out. So we wanted students to look at it and to kind of get a better intuition of what that would look like. So this is a life size, this is like life size, 3D printout of a vocal tract. And so we modeled mathematically what it would mean for air to go through here. And if you had obstruction, what would that signal look like? And that's how we created our algorithms. We basically created a vocal tract model. And from the vocal tract model, we can basically figure out the amount of airflow, uh, the airflow to sound rate, uh, um, uh, correlation. So based on the changes in the sound, how much airflow is created. And so that's how we did the initial simulation. And then we did the clinical trial to validate it. And so this, actually, this technique actually works really well. In fact, it's as accurate as a $10,000 clinical spirometer. It's like a 99 cent app, right? So it's just so different, right? I mean, just, and, and the way we sense, this, sense airflow, it's very different, too. There's no sensor. We completely borrowed a technique that wasn't ever designed for doing vocal tract resonance monitoring for pulmonary patients. It was for speech recognition. And we borrowed it and, and tweaked, tweaked that approach in a new way that we use it for pulmonary monitoring in this case. So one of the things that we were really interested in was, so we created an app called SpireSmart. The problem is it requires a mobile phone app on a smartphone. 
And so we actually collaborate really closely with the Gates Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we wanted to create a service where it could actually be uh, pro uh, usable for the entire population in the world. And so outside the US in developing regions, um, there's a lot of smartphone usage, but the phones aren't quite smart enough. They don't quite have the, the, uh, the operating system where we can download an app that has the capabilities for the app itself. So we actually created another version of Spyro Smart called Spyro Call. So this is actually a 1-800 number that you dial from any phone in the world, and you can actually do that same maneuver. It could be even a pay phone, it could be whatever phone, and then you can actually do it from any phone in the world, and it comes back with your lung function measures. So if you have a phone with a screen on it, it comes back with a text message. Um, if it's a pay phone, you just listen to it, and it tells you what your uh, pulmonary function tests are. So literally, the 7 billion phones that are actually in the world right now, you can actually do a, a pulmonary test. So anybody in the world can use their phone to basically do an assessment of the lung function. And this is huge, because if you think about some of the, uh, the, the big diseases that are, you know, that the, the, the big diseases outside the U.S. that are, they're, uh, account for the largest deaths um, or actually pulmonary diseases. In the US, it's, you know, it's cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and then pulmonary. In many other parts of the world, pulmonary is actually number one because of air quality issues and a bunch of other things. So for, air, for regions where they don't have access to this technology, you can turn a phone into this, right? And in this case, any phone. So this version of the app isn't as accurate as a smartphone app, but at least it can be used as a screening tool. All right, so every, bone, every phone in the world could be used as a medical monitoring device. So uh, bottom right is an example of a clinic in Bangladesh where they use the phone for screening. Like, they don't need a regular spirometer because they just use this. And this clinic has hundreds of patients that come through this clinic, right? The efficiency by, with this is just huge because they have a lot of patients that they need, need to deal with. There's only one clinic, and they can get hundreds of patients through a day because they can paralyze with a bunch of different phones. All right? So you don't have to have this one expensive device. In fact, some people that do have phones, they can keep track of their treatment while they go home, which is even better. So that's some of the things that you can do here. The other thing we've been working on is um, this interesting area of tracking cough. So if you talk to, a, if you talk to a, a physician, cough sensing is an interesting thing where it's hard to actually manage cough. In fact, if you ask a, pedi a, a pediatrician or, or a physician or a medical professional, you know, if I said I could track cough, what could you do with it? Most uh, medical, medical professionals really say, you know, you can't really do much with cough, right? Cough is the number one symptom for a lot of diseases, for the common cold, for influenza. Uh, but we have this hypothesis that we, if we knew how, if we could accurately identify cough episodes using a mobile device, we can start to do epi epidemiological studies that weren't ever possible before. And so, so by taking that same model, you know, we have a full vocal tract model, and we actually figured out how to identify cough out, out in the audio domain. So, so cough's an interesting thing. It's only 300 millisec milliseconds long. So a cough is very short, but very loud. Um, and so if you compare it to other things that might be happening, like throat clearing, speech, uh, other background noise, speech and noise, it looks very different. So coughs actually create a physical signature that is very different than anything else that's produced in the real world, just because how the vocal tract and other things in the body are activated. So it creates a signature that's very different. And so we can accurately identify from any microphone that, uh, that's capturing this information that people are coughing. And so what we've been using this for is to basically uh, identify the uh, spread of tuberculosis in South Africa. So in South Africa, tuberculosis is actually pretty huge. I mean, it's a pretty big problem. One of the challenges right now is we don't know how it spreads. Is it a super spreader? Is it one person that spreads it? Is it a collection of spreaders? And so by installing microphones at strategic locations in hospitals and clinics uh, and churches and schools, we can start to do epidemiological studies on, on coughing episodes that are changing throughout the community to figure out where uh, patient zero was for that particular outbreak, all right? Because coughing is a big symptom of TB. And so you can do this interesting thing where with, with manually, it would be impossible to do. Like, how would somebody listen to all this audio and annotate it when things happen? Well, with a computer, with a, with a uh, machine learning algorithm, you can automatically do this and say exactly when people were coughing and how often they were coughing. Um, the other thing that we're doing, which, uh, so this is an example of where these things are installed. So we've actually installed them in communities, in some of the, uh, in some of the hospitals. We also use them to die, uh, not only, um, uh, tracking the spread of the disease, but when somebody's diagnosed, you can actually track how often they're coughing and see if the chemotherapy that they're under is actually improving their situation or not. Because this is a really strict regimen that you have to be on, uh, the reduction in coughing is correlated to improvement in health, obviously. And so these microphones provide an objective measure of if that treatment is working or not. Uh, so when we did a study to, where we had people self-report, how often do you cough when you're sick? So we had somebody, all right, you have the flu, 
Think about how often you're coughing. Just keep track. People grossly underestimate it by two to 300 percent. Some people might say, oh, I only cough four times this hour. Well, it's, it turns out that you actually cough 200 times. Right? It's one of those things, coughing, is you kind of just cancel it out. You just kind of don't think much about it. It's this thing that's happening, and, um, and, and it's something you don't pay a lot of attention to. But with a, with a device like you know, a, a microphone that's being analyzed, you can actually do things that are objective. So the other thing we're doing in South Africa is we actually think that we found an acoustic signature for tuberculosis. So how do you screen TB? The way you screen TB is you do a chest x-ray. So if you see granuloma in the chest, uh, in, the, in the chest cavities, that means you have TB. Um, you might do a blood test, or you might do a sputum test. You might cough up sputum and analyze it. Um, but that all requires a pretty invasive procedure. One of the things that we're studying right now with the Gates Foundation is that we may actually be able to screen for TB from just the cough. So if somebody is coughing in a room, we can say that that person may have TB or not. So think about how you can scale a screening tool in a region like, uh, in, in many regions uh, where TB is prominent, where you can't screen everybody that quickly, where you can actually use a microphone to quickly do an acoustic screening of tuberculosis. And the reason why we think we can do that is, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, the lungs typically have this granuloma, or this cavity that forms. And what happens is when you cough, it changes the sound of the cough. The human ear can't really differentiate between that subtle change in the cough, but a computer can. And so that's what we've been doing. So that box on the left is a, a test a site that we have where in South Africa we have a box where people with TB go into it and just, they just sit there and watch TB. Uh, and, and, and within 15 minutes they're going to cough enough and we get their acoustic samples of what their TB cough sounds like and we're doing an analysis to see how accurate our TB detection algorithm is. And this is huge. This is from a microphone that doesn't even have to be on the person. You can actually have you know, people just walk through a booth and you could do a screening within a matter of seconds. Just think about the volume of people that you can screen that way. So I mentioned this earlier. Um, so this other area that we've been working on is non-invasive blood screening. And so, so we've been doing things like hemoglobin assessment. And hemoglobin is interesting because it's really useful for people with sickle cell anemia. So for people that are anemic, uh, pregnant women that might be anemic or might be um, in danger of being anemic, and malnutrition. Um, so hemoglobin is actually an interesting measure. The problem is, is you can't do that at home. I mean, you're not going to do your, a blood test and an assay at home. But what can you do uh, on a phone that can actually give you an indication of your hemoglobin so that if something's happening, you can actually take uh, the right course of action? So the way that the hemoglobin app works is, um, so this is implemented, this is a vision on an Android phone where you start the app, it, it uses the camera and the flash. The flash, we actually modeled what the lighting properties are. And so it's flashing, and you put your finger on it. So basically, light is perfusing through your finger, and it's being reflected back to the camera. So there's enough perfusion of blood on your fingertip that we can actually see what the constituent is. So at the bottom, you kind of see the heart rate. So we lock onto the heart rate to make sure that their finger is actually there. So we know that that actually is you know, live tissue there. And then what it does is it gives you um, a result in grams per deciliter, which is exactly what you get from a complete blood count. All right? um, and the way this works is we created an algorithm where it basically identifies the, amount, the, the percentage of plasma versus red blood cells. And the percentage of red tells you total hemoglobin concentration. And the way it works is it, we use this property where plasma and, red, and, and hemoglobin respond, have different absorption rates for different frequencies of light. When you shine light at it, it's going to either reflect it or absorb it, depending on what frequency it is. And if you look at the modern phone, phones are really good at taking good pictures, right? I mean, if you, if you have an SLR in your iPhone, sometimes your iPhone camera picture looks better than your SLR picture because of the, of the great lengths they go to in terms of designing the optical system and also the lighting system in such a way that you get this uh, the, this really nice flash that has a lot of these properties where it has a, a wide, you know, white flash with wide wavelengths of light. And so what we can do is we can shine a known wavelength of light because a lot of these phones have infrared, they have a, a red LED, some of them have white LED. So we know the white wavelength of light from the phone and we can look at the absorption coming back from the finger. And so from the absorption, we can start to figure out if it's plasma or hemoglobin. And if you're trying to solve for this equation, you need two colors, all right? So you shine two different colors of light. Um, but, but it's actually harder than that. So if you think about it, you know, people's skin colors are different. So how do you, can't, how do you like, detect the amount of color in hemoglobin when the skin pigment could actually cause an issue there too? And what we do is, um, when, you, know, you saw the heartbeat that we can see because of the cardiac activity from the camera. Uh, what we do is we only analyze the data when you have the heartbeat um, uh, occurring. 
And so what that means is if the heart is beating, you're seeing volume of blood coming to the fingertip. And so when you see that relative change in volume, you know that the color is being contributed by the blood and not by the finger. Because the finger is not going to be throbbing. The finger color is going to be consistent, whereas the volume that's at your fingertip as the heart's expanding and contracting is the thing that you want to focus on. And so what we do is we basically uh, only analyze it when the heart is beating. So, so if you ever put your finger on your phone and capture a video, that's what it looks like. So you can kind of see that little throbbing that's happening. That's your heartbeat. That's the volume of blood that's changing at your fingertip. You can do that in any ordinary phone. Anybody can pull out a phone and do this. And you'll see that throbbing. And so what we do is whenever we have that throbbing, we look at that difference in that percentage to say that, OK, we're only going to analyze it when there's blood there so we can cancel out the, the skin color. So the skin color actually doesn't matter in this case. Um, so we actually adapted this to a different application for bilirubin. So one of the big challenges for newborns, uh, you may hear, you might hear of you know, parents talking about, oh, my kid was born with jaundice, this yellowing of the skin. The reason why that happens is because bilirubin gets built up into the blood. So the liver and the pancreas haven't quite developed yet when the kids are really young. And so you get bilirubin that peaks. And if bilirubin is untreated, um, it can actually lead to this issue of things like carnicterus or brain damage. So these are things we need to screen babies early and get them treatment very soon. But the problem is, is that bilirubin doesn't peak until day four or five of life. So when a baby is born, it, it doesn't peak until the baby and mother have already been discharged out of the hospital. And so often parents are asked to do visual assessment. Does your baby look yellow or not? It's like, how do I answer that question? The baby always looks yellow. Or no, I, don't, I can't tell the difference. I mean, how do you tell the difference of yellow or not? And so this is an app where you can use a flash and the camera, and you take a picture of the sternum of the baby, and it can tell you how much bilirubin is in the, in the blood of that baby. So you can actually take the right course of action, depending on what the situation is there. And again, this has huge implications for um, uh, technology for the developing worlds. Um, so we actually analyzed this in uh, nearly 600 babies across the US. So we've actually shown that this thing actually tracks just as well as a blood test. And you can use it as an alternate technique for doing some of this. Um, this is a quick one I want to mention. We actually have another app on osteoporosis where you can use the accelerometer and gyro on a phone to basically figure out the density of your bones. And so the idea behind this is that you know, instead of doing an x-ray, which you can't do every month or every week, it, the idea here is that you can use the accelerometer and gyro by holding the phone in your arm, and you do an impulse response. So if you tap your elbow on a table, the frequency of vibration that's absorbed and amplified through your bones tells you if there is an increase in density or reduction in density. And so we've been doing experiments where you can actually do osteoporosis uh, screening just using a mobile phone. You don't even have to do an x-ray for it. So these are just a set of projects that we've been working on where you can do diagnostics at home that can really change how we administer diagnostic techniques and how we actually create uh, treatments for monitoring and managing chronic diseases. Um, so the next steps for what we're doing is we're using this as research platforms. The researchers are using this to do clinical trials. We're actually going through FDA with some of this stuff. You can just imagine the conversations we're having with FDA where they barely even understand what a phone is, let alone doing you know, hemoglobin assessment on the phone. They just don't understand that. They don't believe us. They, had to, they invited us there, and they had to do it themselves to believe us even. Um, and we're working with managed care providers and accountable care organizations who want to integrate this into practice where they want to be able to manage chronic diseases in more effective ways where people don't have to keep coming back to the physician or back to the ER or the urgent care. And so we're working across the board, both on the regulatory side, but also on the people, on the stakeholders that you know, can take advantage of this and use this in the care system. So, but anyway, so that was a little bit of a whirlwind tour of a lot of different projects. But I want to just highlight that none of this would have been possible without thinking about innovations that happen at the boundary of these technologies. The people that contributed aren't just the computer scientists or just the engineers. These are the biomedical engineers, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, professional, the med, med school professionals, the, uh, the, the physicians that we work with, uh, the folks that we're working on the regulatory policy side of things. This is a pretty interdisciplinary set of projects that require us to attack this problem from many different angles. And the other thing is that, you know, there's many different opportunities to Im have impact in energy and health. You know, I could have been a physician, I could have gone down that path, but I think I can have equal impact in the health industry by being an engineer or a computer scientist, by introducing new capabilities that weren't possible in the past. So I think any field that you select or choose, you can still have an impact on your passion. Like your, if your passion is solving global warming, you can address that from pretty much any field. Um, and I think that's something that's really interesting is, you know, what are you really good at and what role can you play in solving these grand challenges? I think, um, I think a lot of these different disciplines can play a role. And then, um, like I mentioned, all of this work that we do is interdisciplinary. Very rarely do you have innovations that are happening which is done by one siloed group. 
it really cuts across many different uh, uh, disciplines. So, so with that, I'll take questions. Thank you for your attention. I just want to thank my students. So I, I get to talk about this fun, great work. I get all the accolades and the awards, but really the awards don't go to me. It goes to my students. The students, my grad students, my undergrads, my high school students that work on these projects are the ones that actually do the real work. And so this is actually a picture of them in Hawaii. So when I got tenure, a few years ago, um, I basically said, you know what, we're just going to skip lab for this week. We're going to go to Hawaii. Right? This is the best thing I could give them. And this is, barely, this, is, this is just scratching the surface on what I could give them, because they gave me a job for life, tenure, and took them to Hawaii. We had a great time. But I have to give all the credit to the students. It's not me doing this. It's the students. All right? Great. So thank you, and I will take your questions. <laughs>